Genesis chapter 2. Turn there if you would. We're, uh, we're approaching a, a little stretch here where we get to talk about relationships. Um, we're not necessarily going to talk about marriage or parenting today, even though that is on the immediate horizon. But today we get to talk about relationships in general. And one of the areas I think about when it comes to relationships in our culture today is uh, Facebook. So Zuckerberg is, um, has been testifying about the, uh, about the topic of the invasion of our privacy. You know, some 80 million plus people who use Facebook have had, and here's the scary phrase, have had their information harvested. Who had their info harvested, I wonder? We don't, we don't know, right? Uh, but the topic has been, you know, what may have been private or so we we're thinking was private, maybe wasn't so private after all. And so there's this been an invasion of privacy and this harvesting of your own personal information that's been going on. And Mark Zuckerberg has been questioned about what he's known and maybe things we can do to protect our privacy all the more. But Facebook is this platform that's used by millions and millions and millions of people. And uh, what's interesting is in our culture, in our times, it's really become a, 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 a substitute for true friendships, I believe. And I'm not going to poo-poo Facebook altogether because I think there are some wonderful ways you can connect with family and friends and share photos and, and things like that. But, you know, when you, when you look on someone's profile and they've got a thousand friends... You wonder, well, really, how deep are those friendships, right? The, the median number of friends that someone has on a Facebook is 150. So on average, everyone has about 150 friends. Some have more, some have less. There was one guy last year who set out to, to prove that friendship must exist beyond Facebook. And so what he did is he went through his entire log of friends that he has on Facebook, and he personally went around the country to visit each one of his friends in person. Can you imagine that trip? Like, all of a sudden, you get the knock on the door, and it's like, hey, you maybe saw me online two days ago, but now I hear him, here I am on your porch, right? And I, and I love the fact that this guy did that, right? He wanted these people that he is friends with on Facebook to know that their friendship exists beyond Facebook. And he said after it was all said and done, his friends and his friendships were deepened and enlarged and better for it. And I sit there and go, you know what? When it comes to friendships, we all know the, the bitter sweetness that's involved in those relationships. There are people we were besties with back in the day that we're no longer besties with. You know, the term BFF is not thrown around liberally among many of us. We've been hurt. We've been damaged by relationships. And, you know, the people that we thought we were going to grow old with back in high school, there's just no memory of them anymore. And people come and people go. And, and friendships, though, in our lives are critically important. And today I want to talk about friendships. I want to talk about relationships. And I want to talk about it in light of a word that I think is missing in our culture. Some may see it as archaic, but the word is this. It's covenant. I want you to write down that word because it is a word that is used frequently throughout the Bible. It is a word that is used frequently when it comes to God's relationship with his people. It is a word that I believe ought to be shared and experienced among those of us who call ourselves God's people. Um, C.S. Lewis had a great quote. He said this in his book, The Four Loves. He said, friendship is unnecessary like philosophy, like art. It has no survival value. Rather, it is one of those things which give value to survival. Now wrap your mind around that, right? We need each other. As I mentioned before, no man, no woman is a lone ranger in this thing we call life. No man is an island. We were designed for relationship. Unfortunately, we have bought into the lie that relationships are built on a contract or consumeristic basis. And we've left behind the idea that true honoring relationships are really relationships built on 
covenant. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to write down the word covenant. And next to it, I want you to write down the word contract or consumer. Because your relationships will fall into one of those two categories. Either you have covenant relationships, which we're going to define this morning what those are, or you have consumer or contract relationships. Let me give you a little contrast picture to see if it, it give you a little bit more idea of what I mean by these two things. So covenant versus contract. Contract says you had better do it. Covenant says, how may I serve you? Covenant, a contract says, what do I get? Covenant says, what can I give? Contract says, what will it take? Covenant says, whatever it takes. Contract says, it's not my responsibility. Covenant says, I'm happy to do it. Contract says, it's not my fault. Covenant says, it's my responsibility. I accept responsibility. Contract says, I'll meet you halfway. Covenant says, I'll give 100%. Contract says, I'll be faithful for now. Covenant says, I'll be faithful forever. Contract says, I am suspicious. Covenant says, I am trusting. Contract says, I have to. Covenant says, I want to. Contract says, it's a deal. Covenant says, it's a relationship. You, you get the picture? Too many of us have bought into a contract slash consumer idea of relationship, which has the focus of me. I've got to look out for me. The holy trinity in this world is me, myself, and I. Whatever I need to do to protect myself, right? Versus covenant, which exists for the betterment of the other person. This has always been in the heart of God, and he has designed us to not only know this about him, but he's also designed us so we can share the same covenant relationships with one another. Even Aristotle came up with three pictures of friendship some 2,000 years ago. He said, you have one of three relationships going on. There's the friendship of utility, which means what can we get from one another there's the friendship of pleasure. What sort of things and hobbies do we share together? We can go out for a beer, but I'll never invite you over for dinner kind of relationship. Or there's the friendship of virtue, which exists to make one another better. And so this morning, I believe God wants us to understand the idea of covenant because covenant is not going to act as a solid foundation between you and your God. Covenant is going to act as a wonderful foundation for you and your relationships in this life. John Piper said it this way, no one breaks a covenant or contract because it hurts to do so. Covenants are broken because it feels good to be free from commitment. Covenant breaking is a way of pain reduction. And in the process of reducing our emotional pain, we destroy life. Relationships are hard. We're not sitting here saying they're not. Relationships are difficult, and it is so easy to throw the towel in on any relationship the moment the pain starts setting in. And the question in any relationship before God is not, what do I need to do to get out of this relationship? The question is, what do I need to do to make it better? Contract is, I'm out. You had your 90 days, it's up. Covenant says, I'm committed no, ma no matter how much it hurts. Someone else wrote these words, a contract is an agreement made in suspicion. The parties do not trust each other, and they set limits to their own responsibility. A covenant is an agreement made in trust. The parties love each other and put no limits on their own responsibility. So this morning, covenant is of critical importance. Why? I believe covenant holds the cure for every conflict the nurturing for every need, the forgiveness for every failure, the blessing for every burden, the triumph for every tear, and the love for every longing. That's why this is important. 
So three things we're going to talk about this morning. Number one, the basis of covenant. Number two, the benefits of covenant. And thirdly, the blessings of covenant. The basis of government. Uh, government. For some reason, covenant and government decided to collide in my mind. The basis of covenant. So covenant, the word is used more than 300 times just in the Old Testament. And it literally means an agreement between two or more persons. And it's been used for thousands of years in civilized societies to promote understanding, to resolve conflicts, to provide parameters for relationships. So the idea of covenant was really one that was born in the heart of God. And covenant is important when it comes to God and who he is and his relationship with us as his creation because he always wants us to know that relationship, a vibrant, life-giving relationship with him is never based on rules. It's always about relationship. It's, it's organic. It's living. It's, it's not policy. It's about people. And the moment you bring rules and policy into your relationship with God, it becomes legalistic. It becomes uh, stubborn. It becomes um, just so fundamental. It takes the life right out of the, the fact that God wants to walk with us on a daily journey. And so the idea of covenant is one of relationship. And so here's God who gives this relationship to human beings who are the only ones created in his image. Nothing else in creation has been created in his image. And he wants to share himself with creation. And three things you need to understand. Number one, God is a covenant God. The Bible is a covenant book. And we as his people are a covenant people. And there's nothing more important than those three things. God, the word, and his people. That's why in De Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9, Moses writes these words. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keeps his commandments to a thousand generations. Do you know how many a thousand generations are? It's a lot. But this is what Moses writes about. The next verse, Exodus chapter 6, Moses writes these words, I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. He's a God who delivers. He's a God who rescues. He's a God who will always be faithful and true to his word. He is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. And there are covenants throughout the Bible. I mean, we can think of the, the, the covenant with Noah, right? What was the symbol of, of the covenant with Noah? The rainbow. I promise never to flood the earth again. He made a covenant with Abraham. If you remember in Genesis chapter 15, when he cast a, a, a sleep to fall over Abraham, and God himself, representative as a torch of fire, walks between the two halves of the animal sacrifices, saying to Abraham, the covenant I'm making with you to bless the world is solely on me. And if I, God, break the covenant that I'm making with you, Abraham, for the world, let it be done to me as it's been done to these animals, which was the severing and destroying and death to these animals. We know the promise made to Moses. We have that through the Ten Commandments. We have the covenant made with the prophets. We have the covenant made with David, 2 Samuel chapter 7, where he says, says to David, you will have an ancestor that will sit on the throne forever. And guess who that ancestor was? Jesus. But the greatest covenant is with Jesus. Look at Hebrews chapter 9. Awesome verse, verse 15. This is why Jesus, when he celebrated the Last Supper with the disciples, said, I tonight make a covenant with you. And that covenant is through my blood. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant. And let me just tell you, it is new. It is perfect. It is final. It, it overcomes all the other covenants that came before it. It enfolds all those covenants. He says, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. What was the first covenant? The one made with Adam, where Adam turned his back on God and rebelled and was disobedient. 
So Christ comes to reverse the curse that sin has on humanity from the first representative of the human race, Adam. And so we get to talk about Jesus. We get to talk about our love for, for God in covenant and love for one another. And let me just tell you, the, the covenant God makes with us through Jesus is incredible. Deuteronomy 30. I'm going to give you guys a lot of verses, all right? So a long pencil is better than a short memory, all right? So write these down. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and your heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 27. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules, my law, my will. See, what's amazing is God not only enters into covenant with us through Jesus, he gives us the power to live the lives that we are designed to live, right? He not only opens our eyes and awakens our heart to his majesty and to his beauty, he gives us the strength to be the people he wants us to be. That is awesome. So here's what I want you to do in the side of your notes. I want you to write down these, these three phrases. God makes a new covenant with us. And then through that new covenant, we become a new creation. And because we're new creations, we are a new community. New covenant, new creation, new community. Our love for one another ought to reflect the love that has captured our hearts. We ought to be living examples and testimonies to the character of God and how he's loved us. This is why Jesus says, the world's going to know that you're my people, you're my disciples by your love for each other. And so what we have to realize is that covenant is now not only something that's extended to us by God, it is now something shared among us as his people and ought to be explored in a much better, deeper fashion than it has been. The church is not a place where we delve out consumer goods. You know, we are a, a, a living, organic community of people that are just trying to live life to the glory of God to the best we can. We're not perfect. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. And so what we realize is that we are called to be covenantly committed to one another. And it's unfortunate when people leave churches and find another church to go to because, you know, I didn't like the children's ministry. You know, they went to this new label system in the kids' ministry. We're just not into that. We're going to go to another church. Really? Is that why we leave churches? You know, I don't like that church because the, the singer, he sounds like a country singer. And I don't like that guy. I don't like, I don't like. Hey, you know what? I have grown in my affection for country music because of Jacob. So, see, I help Jacob love Jesus. He helps me love country music. And that, that's kind of the way it works. So, um, it's a covenant, right? You know, I don't like the fact they don't serve Starbucks. We don't talk like that around here, you know? We serve our coffee, not other coffee, cold by mermaids in the ocean or whatever, you know? That's not us, you know? But people leave churches all the time. Why? Because most of the time, probably nine times out of ten, it tends to be something consumer-oriented. We don't like the seating. We don't like the music. We don't like the kids' ministry versus when should we leave a church? We should leave a church when they no longer preach the gospel. We should leave a church when they no longer consider the word of God the very thing that is designed to give us life and godliness. We should leave a church when they give up praying. We should leave a church when they fail to recognize the Trinity. We should leave a church when they basically don't encourage you to live your life for Jesus out there and have opportunities to talk to your friends and families about. That's why we leave churches. But unfortunately, we have churches that cater to the consumeristic mindset. And we won't do that. We won't do that. Why? Because it is not about consumerism. It is about covenant. And I have had my heart broken one too many times because people have left just at that moment when God is starting to do something and bring us into deeper intimacy with one another in Christ, people scoot. Because they're feeling it. They're feeling like, oh, you're going to know me and I'm going to know you. And we get uncomfortable with that. 
Yet the greatest desire within every single human being is to love and be loved, to know and be known, and to accept and be accepted. That means warts and all. That means my imperfections and everything. And I've got a lot of them. But yet when we get to know one another as God knows us and we accept one another in that, we get to grow deeper together. Look at Genesis chapter 2. Check this out. So God has designed Adam and in chapter 2, he's, he's basically said, Adam, I've set you up in paradise. I've set you up for success. I have set you up to have freedom, to to have dominion, to rule, to subdue all that I have given to you. And, and we, we have clear instructions of what he's to do. And then yet there's one stipulation that God gives to Adam and says, there's one tree you shall not eat from. And God put that there because man needed to have an, an, an instrument, uh, something there to, to test his faithfulness to test his obedience, and we'll talk more about that in the week, weeks to come. And so now in chapter 2, verse 18, God recognizes something that's not good in creation. It's the first time there's something that's labeled not good. Because up to this point, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's very good. And now we have a not good. Look at verse 18. God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. So, so consider this. There's a, there's a deficiency in what God has created, and it's not as if God went, oops, I didn't see that. I didn't plan on that. But he recognizes, and he wants man to recognize, and man's already feeling this inside, that there's nothing in creation that's like him. And there's something that's, there's an emptiness and God sees that it, and says it's not good for man to be alone. We have been wired for relationship. And so he says, I will make him a helper suitable for him. Well, notice what happens next. Verse 19. So out of the ground, the Lord formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was his name. Can you imagine like the creativity in Adam at this moment? I mean, how do you come up with aardvark? You know, like, you know, how do you come up with manatee? Personal favorite. How do you come up with three-toed sloth? You know, how do you come up with this stuff? And yet all those names are somewhat representative of the, the characteristics of that creature. And yet Adam names all the animals. What an incredible privilege he had to do this. And yet, verse 20 says, a man gave name to all the cattle, the birds, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not a helper found that was suitable for him. So it's almost like God creates these creatures, parades them in front of Adam. He's given them names, right? We don't know if it was alphabetical or what, but he gives them names. And deeper and deeper, the loneliness becomes. And not among any of these creatures was a companion for Adam. It was almost like God was showing him that there is nothing in the animal kingdom that could ever minister to that loneliness like another person. He's just setting the stage. And then God at his perfect time, in his perfect time in verse 21, says, all right, I'm going to cause a deep sleep to fall upon you. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And the Lord fashioned out of that rib a woman. And this woman was taken from man and brought to her, uh, brought to him. And the man said, now, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And for this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. The, the, the concluding verse there says there is incredible transparency and vulnerability in this relationship without fear of judgment or condemnation. And, and we're going to talk about marriage. Not today, but we're going to talk about what this scene ultimately sets up for us. But as foundational, we need to talk about relationships and the fact that you and I exist in relationship for relationship. See, God has entered covenant with man. And now he expects us to live out a covenantal relationship, friendship with one another. 
What do those look like? Here they are. Five benefits of covenant. The five benefits of covenant. These are things found in God's covenant with us, and these are things that are now shared by us with one another. And if these five ingredients or benefits for covenant friendship are in place, you're going to have a rocking friendship relationship with other people. Now, when I say in place, I'm not saying they're perfected. What I am saying is that there's some presence of these five things in your relationships, but they're growing. You never arrive in your relationships with one another. I will never arrive with my wife. She will never arrive with me. There's constant ebb and flow of growth and maturity and learning and failing and falling and making mistakes, but they're ever growing, ever constant because that's our relationship with God. You don't sign up with Jesus and he goes, you got an A plus for the class. Go ahead and just write it out the rest of the semester. You're always in this flux of walking with God, learning from him, obeying, disobeying, all that. It's the same thing with our relationships. The moment you come into relationship with me, don't just assume that my title pastor means I'm perfect. I am fraught with mistakes. Can I get an amen? Thank you. Thank you. Fraught. Fraught to go with my frock. You know what I'm saying? As a minister, as a reverend. So five things. That ought to be true in every covenant relationship. It's because they're true with God with us. They ought to be with one another. First is this. Covenant blood. Covenant blood. Covenant is based upon sacrifice. We see this throughout scripture. Covenant with Adam. Adam rebels. And what does Adam do? He goes and hides. What does God do? He takes the initiative and seeks Adam out. And he says, Lord, I'm naked. I'm ashamed. I'm hiding in the bushes. And what does God do? He commits the first murder in the garden by killing an innocent animal so that the hide of that animal will now act as clothing for Adam. This now sets the trajectory for the entire Old Testament saying, you will not have relationship with God unless sacrifice is made. And what's the ultimate sacrifice made for us to cover us in our nakedness and our, our shame? Jesus. Consider the words of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 33 through 34. Th- these, this is rich right here. This is the covenant that God will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. See, this has nothing to do with the law on the tablets that Moses brought down from Sinai. This has to do with the law that's written on our hearts. And I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. Now don't miss this, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This is the promise of covenant blood. That we have had two things done now in Christ because of God's riches of mercy. He says to us two things. I have forgiven you and I have cleansed you. What amazing grace. Amen. What wonderful mercy. Amen. That God knows the despicable people we are. I know the despicable person I am. And that God would say, I love you, Scott Morgan. And I love you so much that I would send my son to die a death he didn't deserve to die, to have his blood spilled for you so that now you could have forgiveness of sins. What incredible life is to be found in that. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22. According to the law, all things are cleansed with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So this is why Jesus had to die for us. There is no forgiveness without sacrifice. Sacrifice is the heart of covenant. So now what does that look like? That means that I should be in a place now because God took the place for me 
that when it comes to my relationship with you, that I am willing to lose in order for you to win. Covenant love says that I am willing to die to self so that you may live. How countercultural is that mentality? Where we live in such a me first, self oriented culture that only looks out for ourselves and has no consideration of somebody else. And so love always forgives. Love always covers the sins for, for uh, you know, love covers a multitude of sins, according to, to Peter. And so our friendship should be made up of that spirit. That if I hurt you, there is a covenant blood that covers that hurt. Because forgiveness requires someone's going to make the payment. Unfortunately, many of us live in unforgiving relationships where we're demanding payment from the person that we need to forgive and take that payment upon ourselves. And so Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32 are your marching orders today. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And there's a person that says, I can't forgive. I sit there and go, let's strike the word can't from the sentence and replace it with the word won't. Because the real issue is that you choose not to. There's a deliberate choice in saying, I, I won't forgive you. Well, you won't forgive. Well, you're going right against the very forgiveness you claim to know because Jesus forgives you. And I'm glad I don't go before God and go, God, will you forgive me? He says, nope, I'm not going to forgive you today. Because the word says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, that if we confess our sins, we will find that he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins. He is a forgiving God. He has done it to cover our sins. He has done it to take away our iniquity. He has given us his righteousness in Christ. Who am I now to withhold forgiveness from you? And who are you to withhold forgiveness from me? And this is what makes our relationship stronger, is the ability to forgive one another. There is no sin that is beyond us being able to forgive in one another's lives. Amen? I'm going to tell you right now, there's an illustration that I think about in, in my life, about my father-in-law. An incredible act of forgiveness he extended to his dad. So I want, I want to set up the scene for you. For, for years and years and years, my wife, had grandparents, her dad's parents, that just refused to have relationship with the family. Can you imagine having kin that just said, you know what, we're not going to have relationship with you. No birthdays, no Christmases, no vacation, no, no, nothing. She grew up, my wife grew up with grandparents she never had a relationship with until her grandmother died. All of a sudden there's a phone call from Lori's grandfather to Lori's dad. I don't know what to do. I'm alone. And without blinking an eye, Lori's dad said, you come out and live with us. Here's a father who deliberately chose not to have a relationship with his son. And yet, after years and years and years, the moment this man has great need... What does he find? He finds a son who is ready to take his father in. And he lives in his own house, and he eats the food in this man's home, and there's forgiveness that's extended to this man. And he ultimately dies in the presence of his son. And what's glorious about this story is that he, he dies knowing what true forgiveness looks like that nothing was ever held over this man's head. Nothing was ever used to, to vie for power and control and relationship. When you forgive, you say, you know what? I'm going to choose to no longer ever bring up the past again. We are living in today, and Jesus is in control of today, and I'm not going to bring up the past to shame you or guilt you or condemn you or judge you. You will know the forgiveness of Christ, and that's what this man, Don, went into eternity knowing the forgiveness of Jesus. Forgiveness is powerful. Someone once said, it's every man's need, yet God's highest achievement. 
but how we act as forgiving people and can help make those people walk with Jesus all the more vibrant. How you forgive is vitally important. What is God asking you to do, to do today? How does he need to, who do you need to forgive? Who needs your forgiveness? Who is it that maybe you need to forgive? Who needs to seek forgiveness from you? I, it doesn't matter how it works. We need to be a forgiving, forgiving people. Why? Because of the covenant blood. Number two, covenant grace. Covenant grace that provides that inner strength to handle our hurts and our hassles. We, we are our worst condemners, right? We are, the, we are the worst critics in our own spirits, our own hearts. And I'm going to tell you right now that grace is being given that which you don't deserve. And think about how much you have been given by God that you don't deserve. We are constantly walking in God's grace, right? His common grace of the sunshine and the beautiful weather we ha have right now, even with allergies, you know, we accept it as his grace, amen? But how much more his specific grace he's given us in Jesus? Write down the word grace. Think of it this way. Grace stands for God's riches at Christ's expense. It's really what grace means. Romans 5.21, Paul writes these words. As sin has reigned in death, now grace reigns through righteousness to eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace reigns in Jesus. Think about how much he was a conduit of grace in his earthly ministry some 2,000 years ago. Think about now how much grace needs to reign through his people, the church. Let me just give you, here are your marching orders. You guys ready for this? Uh, do we have Ephesians 4, verse 29? I love when a plan comes together. Here we go. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. You know what this means? This means that people are already condemning themselves. You don't need to participate in that. What you need to do is let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth, but those who know Jesus, your words ought to be grace-giving, life-giving. What does it mean to have friendships? It means that we don't necessarily, it's not like we don't confront one another in love when things need to be brought up, but you don't do it in a condemning fashion. See, there's a way you can approach difficult topics where there's love and grace that's intact and the person knows that you're not attacking me, you're helping me. You're in this with me. See, that's what grace is. We don't deserve to come alongside one another like that, but we do. And especially when it comes to our speech and what we say about one another and what we say to each other, let no unwholesome word proceed, but only that which is grace-filled according to the need of the moment. That's what the word says. And so we come to one another and we affirm one another of who we are in Christ. We affirm one another the truths and the promises of Scripture. These are the things that breathe life into relationships. And when you walk with God together and you understand the grace that's been given to you, you can't help but just continue to just ground one another in that grace. Amen? Number three, there's covenant love. Can I just, there's a great quote on grace. There's a guy, Erwin Lutzer, he said this, there is more grace in God's heart than there is sin in your past. There ought to be more grace in our relationships than whatever's been done in our past. Amen? Covenant love, number three. Unconditional love that's never ending. What's the word that comes up when we talk about biblical love? It's agape. Agape was a word that was literally created when the New Testament was being put together because the Greek culture didn't have a word for unconditional love. They had brotherly love. They had erotic, romantic love. They had a love for appreciation of nature and the arts. But they didn't have a love that described a commitment to you that was unconditional and unending. So the New Testament writers come up with this word agape, which means unconditional love. It is the love that we see in God to us, right? For God so loved the world that he gave did the world deserve it no but he gave and we don't love because first because he first loved us according to first john and then we have this love that's described in hebrews chapter 13 i will never leave you or forsake you kind of love 
Think about that. When you exist in a relationship where someone says to you, I will never leave you or forsake you, that is promising. That is life giving. The fact that I am committed to you. And it is a choice. Love is a choice. Love comes out in our conduct because love is a verb. Amen. Love is about commitment. And so we have this idea of, of love now given to us in scripture that is otherworldly. This is why when they tried to destroy the early church, they were going, how is the church growing so rapidly? And one of the emperors said, because of their love for each other. So our goal to destroy the church is to outlove them. Well, that didn't work out well, right? Because the church grew that much more under the persecution of the Roman emperors. Can you think about that? Has the world some 2,000 years ago looked at the church and said, you know what? We got to stop the church and outlove these people. Or is our love for one another and for others so contagious and so infectious, nothing's going to stop them? Amen? Perhaps we need to, to step it up in the area of love. Can, uh, Romans 12, 10. Write this verse down. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. And then the ultimate love verse, and I, I switched this. Sorry, slide, guys. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Look at these verses. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not boast. It is not arrogant. It is not rude. It is not, does not insist its own way. It is not irritable. It is not resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. All means all. And that's all all means. I mean, think about that. Love never ends. Right? Prophecies, they pass away. Tongues, they'll cease. Knowledge, it will pass away. But there's one thing that will live forever, and that is the love of Christ in and through his people. Ever tell you guys about my friends growing up and how much we shared in this kind of love, even as non-believers, but more importantly, as believers? In high school, the Lord saved me. I was 15 years old. Met this kid, public high school. I know, I went to public high school. That probably explains a lot. I'm sorry. Big high school, 1,000 in my graduating class, right? But I came to know Christ. He saved me in my sophomore year. Met a friend named Kevin, who was also new in the Lord. And boy, we hit it off like that. But as I got to know Kevin, I got to understand his family. How he had an alcoholic father. And every day after school, his dad would be there drinking and just found ways to abuse him physically and verbally. And there were frequent nights where Kevin would come to my house and knock on my window. 2 a.m. Here we are, sophomores in high school, right? Hey, can we go to Denny's and get some coffee and just hang out and talk? Yeah. Let's do that. Man, we frequented Denny's at Tatum and, and, and Cactus all the time. And we were hanging there with sophomore kids who loved Jesus, but yet had families that, for better or for worse, just maybe weren't that most healthy. And a friend named Troy, whose dad died one night and came in the middle of the night and knocked on my window. I guess my window was the one to be knocked on at 3 in the morning. And Troy said, my dad just died. And I've got no one to talk to. And a friend named Mark, who was a little older in Jesus than I was, but just showed incredible love and hospitality to me. I mean, these are the guys that I grew up with in my high school years that we just extended one another love when my mom died. And I didn't go to school. And my friend Jeff calls me. And he knew my mom had been battling brain cancer. And the very first thing he says to me, and again, this is a sophomore in high school. Scott, you're not at school today. Did your mom die? And I couldn't say anything to him. But he knew. And he said, I love you and I'm praying for you. These are high school kids, boys. That, that barely knew Jesus, but I tell you what, the love of, and compassion of Christ was coming through. This is what we need with each other. I'm not saying come knock on my window. We have a two-story house, so it's going to take a ladder to get up there, but you know what I'm saying? Who, who are your window knockers in your life, huh? Who are those that can call you at any time, come over unannounced, just say, hey, I need someone to talk to. We need each other like that. That's the kind of love that defines who we are because this is the kind of love that has come from God and invaded our world and touched our hearts. 
Number four, we better get a move on. Stop this cry fest, all right? <laughs> Covenant power. Covenant power. Meaning we will be a community that continues to lean on the power of God who's at work in us for better, for, for, for great purposes, for God's will, for his work. We are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but we understand it is the power of God unto salvation for all who would believe. Amen? We are not given the spirit of fear and timidity, but we are given the, the spirit of power. That you and I have the resurrection power of Christ dwelling within us so that we can become the people God has designed us to be for his glory and our good. See, we need to have relationships that are ripe with this perspective of, yes, you can do it. Because in Christ, I can do all things. Because in, him, in me is his strength that will perfect me to, to accomplish what he wants me to accomplish. See, we need to be with one another uh, and encourage one another that there is power to do the work of God. There is power to live according to the will of God. Can I tell you this week, I was really encouraged. I was reading about, this, this is going to sound very, I was reading about the martyrs of the church, men and women who gave their lives. There was a guy named John Rogers. Write down his name, 1555. That was, a, that was a few years ago. There were men and women who died under the, the reign of Queen Mary who were killing Christians right and left. Blame Mary. John Rogers was a pastor. And what they would do to get rid of the pastors and the churches, they would find someone who was speaking the gospel and said, stop preaching or you'll die. And this guy, John Rogers, was like, kill me. Like, bring it on, right? So then what they would do is that they would take the pastor and they would literally burn him at the stake in front of his church. So whatever church you're pastoring, that's where you died. But before you got to the church, they would actually parade you through the town. People you were perhaps ministering to, people you were praying for, people who were maybe part of your church, and maybe people who were against you. So there would be people sneering and jeering and mocking and laughing at you as you're walking through to your death. But John Rogers, there's a testimony that there were people cheering him on because they knew he would not denounce the name of Jesus. Can you, can you imagine that? You are going to die on a post being burned in front of your own church. And while you're hearing those that are mocking you and, and ridiculing you, there are the voices of those that were your people. And they're saying, carry on. Keep your perspective. Right? And someone wrote of that event that the look of John Rogers was like that of a bride entering the cathedral on her wedding day. Can you imagine a man going to his death? Would they look as if this is the most wonderful celebration in the world that I get to share with you? All because I believe he was drawing not only on the strength of God at that moment, because God has a special reward for those who die for their faith. He was drawing on the encouragement of his church people that were saying, honor God. Love Jesus. And he went and died on a stake in front of his church, not renouncing Jesus, but glorying in his name. I have a feeling none of us are going to die at the stake anytime soon. Amen? But we're going through a lot of issues in our lives. And we need the covenant power reminder for each other, don't we? Don't we need one another to come alongside each other and to cheer one another on? God's got this. You are his child. You're the one whom Jesus loves. Draw upon his strength. Draw upon his power. We need one another to do this. Because without the saints and the cloud of witnesses that are able to help spur one another on towards life and, and good deeds, according to Hebrews chapter 12, we are lonely and we will get defeated. And we will get discouraged. And that's why covenant power is so important. Amen. Last point is this. Did I give you your, your verse on that one? I wanted to give you at least one verse. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. It's God's power that is made perfect in our weakness. It's his strength. It's his power. Last point, covenant hope. 
covenant hope. And this is the reminder that all of us in Christ have a glorious future. Amen? The fact that this is not our home. Don't sink your roots too deep in this world. You are made for another. We are just merely aliens and sojourners passing through, and we need to be reminded once again of the hope that guarantees us a future now and forever. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope. We have a living Christ, who is reigning at the right hand of the Father right now, and even with his disciples in John 14, he said, don't mourn, don't be sad. Why? Because I go and prepare a place for you, and where I am, that's where I'm going to bring you one day. So our hope is that this world is not our home. Our home is being prepared for right now by our Lord, our living Savior, and he's going to welcome us home one day, and I can't wait for that, that moment. That there is a hope that we all have, that we have a hope that guarantees us a future now and forever. Christ is our hope. Hope is certain. And the expectancy and the anticipation of that is sure just as Christ has risen from the dead. Right? We don't mourn as those who have no hope. But hope is the assurance of things hoped for. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Hebrews chapter 11. You want to read a great passage on hope? Read Hebrews 11. The Hall of Faith passage. And I am one who has known hope and continues to know hope, and especially from other people. Because even in my vocation and calling as a pastor, there have been seasons where the enemy would have loved just to leave me in the, in the dust, wondering what's, what's next for me. But men and women coming alongside of me through seasons that were just nasty and ugly, where these men and women believed in me and said, God's not done with you yet. Can you imagine being on the ground and being kicked, especially by other Christians? And, and Christians are notorious for shooting their wounded. Don't be those kind of Christians, okay? But when you're down on the ground and you're wondering what your next step is going to be and wonder if you're just, you're, you're, your calling is done, there are men and women who come alongside of you and said, you are not done yet. Keep going, keep getting. And I, t there are men and women in this church right here, right now, that have breathed hope into me. And I'm only up here telling you guys about it because there's a God who is real and he is really working in the hearts of his people. And there are men and women who have this ability to breathe hope into you when you feel like you're so hopeless. May we do that for one another. Amen. 1 Corinthians 13. Love hopes all things. Things. And what are the blessings? The final point, and we're done. The blessings are the fact that you get to glorify God, you get to grow deep with one another, and we get to call each other friends. John 15, 15. Don't forget who, who's the one that set this course? It's Jesus. No longer do I call you slaves. You're no longer a slave to fear. Amen. You're now a child of God, but more than a child of God, consider this, but I have called you friends. Jesus calls us friends. Now that is wonderful in and of itself. And now we who are in Christ get to call one another friends. And now the goal is to live in covenant commitment with each other forever. And I tell you this, and I don't know what the future holds, but as of right now, I look forward to growing old with you. And just like vows are shared between a husband and a wife on their wedding day, none of those vows are found in Scripture. But there's an unspoken commitment to one another. And I'm committed to all of these things that I've described to you this morning. The blood, the grace, the love, the power, the hope. I'm committed to helping you explore those things as you walk with Jesus. And I hope you're committed to those things in my life as well. So that we live for the glory of God and the good of one another. Amen? Next week, we'll dive into what does Genesis 2 mean and what's going on with the ribs and the women and all this stuff. We'll talk about that next week. So let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your covenant love toward us. And Lord, we have just scratched the surface. 
th this topic deserves more time than I have given it today, but I pray that at least we have something now to hang our lives on and understanding on. That covenant is a word that is rich and it is ripe with so many wonderful blessings and treasures that are contained in it. Father, my prayer is that we would continue to unpack what it means to be in covenant with you and you with us and how that is shared among us as friends. Thank you for this church, for the men and women. Help us to live for your glory and your honor in all we say and do. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Have a great week, you guys. Um, picnic. Hey, thanks for watching the video. We uh, hope you've been blessed and encouraged by, uh, by watching it. Stay tuned for future videos. Uh, if you're ever in the Phoenix area, we'd love for you to join us in person at Sozo Coffee. We're at Warner and Alma School. Two services every Sunday, 9 and 1045. Check out the churchisaverb.org for more information. Have a great week. We'll see you soon. Oh,